Hey, this is Dane Simon here with the World Series of Fighting 27 vivisection, breaking down the what is really the only even it's it, it's the biggest card on a weekend without a big card. So we're here talking about it. I am joined by Victor Rodriguez and Eddie Mercado. They are going to help take us through this. Really unexciting card, even by World Series of Fighting standards, on a weekend without anything really to get excited about as an MMA fan. Guys, tell me that they're the beacon of light and hope, but at at the end of this tunnel, I'm, I'm gonna let <laughs> I'm gonna let Eddie handle that first. Right. I want to hear, hear your thoughts, legitimately. I want to hear what you think about this whole deal. <laughs> well. I think that we have been spoiled by the way the World Series of Fighting has been putting on their cards and putting them together that we finally get hit with, you know, a bit of nostalgia as far as the shit shows that they've put on in the past. And, I mean, this is this is right there with the best of them. I mean, it's kind of a stinker. I mean, there's not too much exciting things going on. We got some prospects, and we got... Um, a guy that just fought for the title, but really outside of that, I mean, it's hard to convince a casual fan to watch this card, so <laughs> not too much positive things to say, unfortunately, but I'll still watch. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be watching this live. This is probably going to be DVR'd. I, I don't know. Uh, this is... This is um... You know, we we've talked about top heavy cards. This is by far the thinnest. I wouldn't even consider it top heavy. And it's not any slight, or there's definitely not any disrespect to any of the fighters. But this isn't a matter of having um, any big name guys or any guys that we know are reliably exciting. The main event has. I mean, there there is there is a small thing, much like the lightweight tournament that we saw that pretty much spiraled out of control. There is a potential for crazy chaos that we might not have expected. But this doesn't seem like it's going to reach those levels anyway because you don't have the what the fuck re of having a tournament that probably shouldn't have been made. So yeah. well, and I mean, do we really even have that heavy expectations? If no, no, and that's the thing, we don't. So yeah. I mean, you you take away the the biggest chunk of it, and like you may have some random pleasant surprises, you know. And, and I hope there are, but at the same time, who's going to be watching? You know, there's no major MMA this week in in North America. Uh, the only other event I can think of is 1FC putting on their card, which actually looks pretty, pretty fun. But uh, yeah, it's kind of sad. You know, this is you you pl claim to be the number three promotion in America. You put on a card like this, and it's it's what it is. Well, I think that you know they would probably argue that they're number two, which is even the uh, <laughs> tougher sell. Yeah, yeah. they're okay. definitely a distant third. Yes. Yes, they oh, are. But before anything else, find me on the Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. Give us a like on the YouTube. That's a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel, MMANation.com. Read Bloody Elbow. Special thanks to Lynx Academy of Martial Arts for teaching me a bunch of stuff that I need to know so I can tell you a bunch of stuff that you want to know. That's sell, Eddie, talk. sell. That's, 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 that's the way to do it. <laughs> you know, I should probably get mine out of the way, too. Big... Shout out to my people over at Balance Studios and theslothreport.com. Please learn some jiu-jitsu. Get something going in your life. Visit the man. Drop something in his bucket. He's got free lessons. Josh Vogel, very, very good guy. I need to get one of, I need to get one of those wrap-it-up boxes. Hey. You guys off, start playing you guys off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. On that note, I'm not going to self-promote at the start of this. You all know who I am. Hopefully, if you're watching this and you don't know who I am, then I I don't know what to tell you. What about all of the new you the new viewers that have never seen you before? You you've been drawn into a trap. You've been drawn into a web of lies, and there you know you will find no solace here if you do not know what's going on already. Well, they're in for some big fucking surprise. I give you that. They they, they don't know what's going to happen now. This is the oh, one yeah. they tune in for. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Like th this is not where you show up if you thought like, ah, you know what? I'll just check something out. Th this is th th this is not a starting point for anybody. Maybe an ending point for a few of us. Um, on that note. Let's let's jump into this because I have spent way too, we've spent way too much time on intro for something that we're, we're the intro is probably longer than we're going to spend on the whole card. <laughs> All right, first up on the main card we have 
Jaleel Willis and Chauncey Foxworth. Eddie, tell me what you know about these two people. They're undefeated. So. All right, so uh, let's see. Jaleel Willis, he's a home guy for what that's worth. Um, coming out of the regional scene, super athletic. He was a high school All-American, so he has a wrestling base. Um, his stand-up, you know, definitely needs some polishing, uh, but he's definitely a condition, a well-conditioned athlete, and you know, that carries you pretty far early on in your, uh, you know, careers or whatnot. The guy's fighting Chauncey Foxworth. Um, I've seen a couple of his fights. Uh, he's got a lot of amateur experience. He seems to have a bunch of, um, you know, not terribly. Um, technical strikes, but he'll throw, you know, a bunch of combos, punches, kicks. Uh, so this is this is a tough one here. Um, I got to give – it's going to be competitive, but I give Jaleel Willis the edge because I think he's just a better athlete. And aside from that, he has been known to do the Carlton dance when he wins. So I'm going to pick him. All right. You got, yeah, I mean, that – you know what? That's like a secret weapon right there. If you could pull it out mid-round, just start <laughs> doing that, you know? Could uh, that could it could just be like an a victory through total, I don't know, dominance. That doesn't even sound right. Vic, save me here. <laughs> oh boy! All right. First off, uh, Jaleel Willis. Probably one of the more interesting aspects is his nickname, the Realist. Um, I don't know. That that doesn't seem. That sounds like one of those things. <laughs> that he, he probably gave himself that nickname, which. We all know, folks. It's it's frowned upon. Don't do that shit, please. Just no. You can't do also, it. Also, if you're an MMA fighter, you are automatically not a realist. I, I hate to tell anybody this out there, um, but if your pro MMA is your career choice, realism you know, is not heavy in here. Well, he he means it in more of the competitive sense. Like he's realer. He's the realer. He's the realist. Not oh, okay. realism, realism, and still, that's okay. still, it's still terrible. It's actually even worse than the real, because then it'd be like, oh, he's part of the skeptic community. He probably, you know, reads Randy newsletters like me. Like, no, no, he doesn't. No, no, that's not what's going on here. Uh, okay. Five and zero is a professional. Five and zero is an amateur. Um, we should mention this card is in Memphis, Tennessee, and there's a lot of the southeast um, regional scene here that's a bit of a mystery, uh, to me at least, because a lot of the a lot of the upbringing is mostly guys that are rooted in either wrestling or boxing. Not much room for phase shifting. We're going to see some of that here and probably note this for some of these other fighters as well. Um, he's got four TKOs, both as a professional and as an amateur. So the guy obviously has the ability to get some guys in trouble with strikes. Uh, Foxworth is currently only 2-0 and as a professional by most accounts. Uh, he does show up as 1-0 and as well. Um, he is 9-6 and as an amateur, though. Uh, the thing about Foxworth that gets me is he's very dynamic. Uh, he definitely hits really, really hard, but his cardio seems a little suspect to me. And not only that, his ground defense is also a little spotty. Now, I, I have seen him get into a bit of trouble, but nothing that he hasn't been able to muscle his way out of. Whereas Willis doesn't seem like a guy who's able to keep a guy on his back for very long and do that much damage from there. So that, I guess it's kind of like one of those things where the ground game cancels itself out for both parties. So we're probably just going to see two guys who are going to hit each other until they get tired, and probably one of them goes to sleep. Uh, if anything, if that is the case, I'd probably favor Foxworth if it's a little earlier. In fact, I'd venture to guess that I'd actually pick him solid just because of the fact that he will hit hard enough that it won't last that long. All right. A, a outside vote for Foxworth. That, um, I don't know, surprising? <laughs> <Like> <laughs> my enthusiasm is... Sorry, it's just not, my heart's not in it. I know, I know. We're odd to have this, Willis is a reasonably sizable favorite, minus 265, up to minus 300. Chauncey Foxworth, plus 264, down to plus 200. So, pretty widespread. Vic's taking the apparently slightly sizable underdog. On that note, Jorge Medina, Bryce Mitchell... Vic, back in your corner. All right. This is actually more interesting than it seems up front because you have a guy like Medina who's 2-0 and as an amateur and 4-2 and as a professional. Three submissions as a professional. Both of his amateur wins were rear naked chokes. Then you got Bryce Mitchell, who, curiously enough, is, uh, has at least 10 amateur wins. His record's a little spotty because there's a few that don't have any results. 
Uh, seven of those finishes, seven of those wins were rear naked chokes as an amateur, and three rear naked choke wins as a professional, netting him at 4-0. and Obviously, we're going to see two very scrappy jiu-jitsu guys, uh, one of them that seems to have a little bit more polished striking than the other. Uh, that would be that would actually be Medina, but Mitchell seems to hit harder. Um, Mitchell seems like one of those cats who just, you know, he started training jiu-jitsu, he ended up being pretty scrappy, he's quick and composed, but, uh, you know, his, his game is mostly swing and cling. You know, he just throws a few punches to close a distance, start grabbing on, and start working from there. Whereas Medina, despite his BJJ base, he's a little more loose with his striking and his approach. He's got a bit of that shuffle step like Keith Jardine going on, but he is very, very hittable. Uh, very good with his back control. Really good at side control. Not necessarily submitting guys from there. So I want to emphasize the word control. He'll slow the pace down from there. But uh, other than that, other than that, I definitely would have to say Bryce Mitchell has the bigger advantage in grappling, and it's going to eventually, it's inevitable that it's going to end up as a grappling match. So we're definitely going with Mitchell here. All right. Eddie, you got anything to add to that? Because that was, like, really, really surprisingly in-depth. <laughs> you spent a lot of time on this, Vic? <laughs> uh, what do you want um, to uh, I mean... I don't know. I think it's going to end up like a grappling match, like Vic is saying. And I think Bryce is is the better grappler. He's got that grinding fine kind of submission style, where you know he's just gonna he's gonna be on you. He almost reminds me of Cody Fister in a way. Does uh, Bryce Mitchell? You know, he doesn't really have the body type to be doing what he's actually doing. Or the know. name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean. I gotta go. I gotta go. Bryce Mitchell here. He seems to be um, a the better athlete and b just the the more polished fighter. I would say so. All right. Mitchell. Odds on this one: Mitchell versus Medina. We've got Bryce Mitchell. Is it the biggest favorite on the card? In fact, minus five twenty up to minus six hundred. Uh, Jorge Medina plus 444 down to plus 350. So I'm not even mad at that. No, I, I can't disagree. No, me neither. Especially given as Bryce seems to hit harder. I mean, you know, he just catches him slipping at one point. He could probably end it that way. Yeah, I gotta oh, well, say, I gotta, well, never mind. I'm sorry. I was gonna say I, I gotta say too that MMA has totally ruined me for pronouncing Jorge correctly. Because okay. of, of the whole like Brazilian Spanish thing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, this dude is this dude is me- he's very very Mexican. Put it that way. Yeah, so. yeah. Y- you're he's good. A Jorge. Yeah. But I I just keep thinking George. Is it George? Because it could George, be George. George, or Jedges, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So Mitchell is the biggest favorite on the card. This brings me to a fight that was going to headline. Uh, but it's now been. It was originally going to be the se- the co-main. Then it was going to headline. Now it's back to co-main. It is the fight on this card that I am most excited about. And that's Shamil Gamzatov, Teddy Holder. Take it away, Eddie. Yeah, I have to agree. This is the one I'm looking forward to the most, which really isn't saying that much. No. But, um. Okay, so we got Teddy Holder. He's coming off a loss to David Branch. He fought for the. 205 title. Um, didn't have a, a, a very good showing at all. He pretty much got worked. He got taken down and just got handled on the ground. But David Branch is actually pretty damn good, as we know, two, top, two division champion. Um, before that, he fought uh, Tiago Silva and shocked the world. Well, I don't know about shocked the world, but he, uh, you know, he, he, he shocked really, the crowd in front of him. <laughs> <laughs> he shocked the crowd in front of him. Yeah, the the ninety people in attendance got no. Um, you know he's he's a really big dude. He's actually home field advantage for Teddy Holder in this one. A uh, really big guy. I mean, just built. You know, super heavy hands. Uh, he he'll stand in the pocket. He'll brawl with you. Heart for days. You know, just a really tough tough out for anybody. Uh, Shamil Gamzatov, on the other hand, uh, comes from Russia. Was on that scene, you know, killing people, wrecking people. He's never seen a third round. He's got um, pretty decent boxing, really fast hands, nice combos, really solid wrestling that, you, you know, you typically see from those Russian fighters. 
you know, he has subs, the belly down arm bars from the back. Uh, I mean, the whole nine. Um, a question mark, though, a couple of them. His last fight was uh, October of 2014. So I'm not sure what the what the problem was with that. Was it visa issues, maybe, trying to come yes, over here? It was. Uh, his last bout was supposed to be at the last event, uh, 20, number yes. 26. He was going to take on Andrea Spang, and he had some sort of visa trouble, so that didn't... That didn't okay. Happen. Had about a pro C fifty five that he was supposed to be go, going after in twenty fourteen. Yeah, that got canceled. Uh, I'm not sure why, but he 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 has had tried to book a couple of bouts in there. Um, okay. All right. So yeah. So he's been out for a little bit, not like terribly long, but over a year for sure. Uh, and another thing is he's never he's he's never fought anybody. You know, he's never fought anybody with a winning record. They've all been, you know, debutantes or cans. You know, and that's you expect to see that overseas. It's hard for him to get, you know, good fights over there. But on the same token, that means he's untested. So we really don't know what to expect. Uh, Teddy Holder, he's fought better people. Um, you know, you got to question his cardio, Holder's cardio, packing on so much muscle. Um, but I think he's he's just going to be the bigger guy, and I don't think Gamzatov is going to have an easy time taking him down. So, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and take Teddy Holder here. I think he's just too much too powerful, and I think he's got what it takes to put uh, Shmuel away and give him his first loss. Vic, your thoughts? Okay, a couple of things on this, and um, I'll try to keep this as brief as I can. Gamzatov, you, a name you very well may remember if you've been reading the uh, Bloody Elbow scouting reports, as you should. They get a lot of work goes into that by, uh, I don't know, that guy right there, Zane Simon. Um, he was number 10 on the rankings there for the 2015 light heavyweight division. Uh, a lot of upside, a lot of promise. Now, the problem is this, and I'm just going to run down what the records of his opponents look like. Yuri Gorbenko, 10 and 25. All right, Shurab, uh, Surab Muradov, 1 and 2. Seven and nine, zero oh and one, zero oh and one, three and three, another zero oh and one, uh, another zero oh and one. So what's that? Five so far? Uh, yeah, there you go. Six opponents, six opponents with no wins on their records. I I don't know what to make of this. I don't know if that's necessarily the best indicator of. I mean, yeah, sure, he's nine and zero, oh, and people will talk about that because we like numbers. It makes us feel like we're understanding the situation a little more than you know. He he seems more uh, intimidating this way. But you look at the records of not only not only his record, but that of the people that he's fought, even the people that have wins under their belt, and it's not very impressive either way. So I would certainly concur with Eddie that he is very much untested. Problem is, is that really going to make that much of a difference? You know, you're talking about a guy who hasn't fought. He's not been. He hasn't been sitting under a mango tree for the last year and change, for however long it's been since he's fought. So. He's going to be taking on a guy who is primarily, first and foremost, a striker, a guy who's not known for having great cardio or great grappling. Um, I would actually, and, and I'm, I'm not sure what the uh, odds are for this, despite everything else, I will still say that Gamzatov has a very good shot to win this. And he could very well look, uh, look like a million bucks here to quit himself. I mean, Holder, 9-2 and two as a professional, 5 TKOs, 2 knockouts. Beat Sean Salmon, Tiago Silva. I don't know what that really says about him. I mean, the loss to Branch probably says more about Branch than anything else. Um, I mean, he had to win that fight. Branch has been looking fantastic in the last few years. But either way, I just don't see... You know, I, I can certainly see Holder putting him to sleep with a couple shots, but he's got to get there first. And I think Gamzatov is probably a little too agile, probably a little too quick, and he's deceptively strong with some of his strikes. So I could definitely see him winning this. Yeah, I mean, I'll just one of the big things that uh, really brought uh, uh, I mean, I think that brought out a lot of the interest in us in Gamzatov wasn't so much his undefeated record, but it's just how big and fast and athletic he looks. You know, it, it's not like. You know, it's not a question of how how good is the opposite opposition he's faced because, frankly, light heavyweight, yeah. and not even just internationally. You know, the UFC brought in Jonathan Wilson on short notice for a, a fight against Chris Dempsey, 
Yeah. And guy came straight out of explode into the UFC and still won by first round knockout. It's just yeah. it's a weird place. And it should be noted too, the scouting reports obviously are, are done based on potential and promise, yeah. not necessarily what they've done thus far. So it's perfectly reasonable that he be up there based on his the assessment of his skills alone. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, it's just all, it, that, yeah. It's it's yeah. I mean, I, and I'm not trying to defend it. I'm just saying that. His, it, the bad record thing, it pretty much goes for every young light heavyweight. Like, there's nobody in that division that you look at and are like, oh, man, this guy's got an amazing record. Basically, the guy, or the guys that are, are, you know, guys we've already heard of now as Yuri Prochazka, Abdul Karim Edilov, uh, Vadim Nem, or Victor Nemkov, some of those, or Mikhail McNachkin, those guys, and that's about it. Um... Otherwise, yeah, I mean, I, the only other thing I can say is that I kind of think of Teddy Holder as, like, an inflated Phil Baroni, so <laughs> take that for what you will. Uh, no without, one the, without the asshole part. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying, like, but just the way he fights. Like, yeah. if, if, if in those first two minutes of round one, he will be this amazing whirlwind of violent, of punching violence, and everything after that is just like downhill in a hot minute. Yeah, yeah. Even as even as wrestling chops don't seem to factor in for much. But then Holder doesn't really have much of that. At least not in, uh, something that's recognizable or big. Not to say that he can't yeah. wrestle, but if that's not what he's there for. That's not what you're paying yeah. the guy to show up and do. Exactly. So I'll be interested to see this. I'm interested to see what Gamzatov does. This is definitely the best opponent he's faced, and. I got to bet on him because I think he's a top prospect. I think he's a great natural athlete with a lot of flow to his game and somebody who can make waves in the future. But it'll be interesting to see him actually take a huge step up in competition. The odds on this fight have Gamzatov favored um, reasonably, minus 264 up to minus 300. Uh, Holder, the underdog, plus 200 up to plus 236. I think that's even a little long, frankly, for a holder being as much of a power puncher as he is early. I mean, not not only that, but I think it's long for the fact that it's, you know, Gamzatov's debut inside the U.S. You know, he hasn't fought in over a year. Uh, Yeah, there's a lot here that could easily go very wrong for Gamzatov. And it's also worth knowing, you know, I, I... I'm not even sure. Looking at Gamzatov now, um, okay, he's yeah, he, he's pretty big. He's six two. He's a pretty big guy. But unfortunately, one of the problems with uh, scouting guys on the Russian circuit is that a lot of them seem bigger than they are because a lot the the weight cutting isn't nearly as standardized over there. So most of them end up fighting up a division from where they should. Mm-hmm. So. You know, it could be one of those things where he's really going to be a natural middleweight and Holder is going to be way bigger. But Gamzatov, if my memory is serving me correctly, it was actually a pretty good physical specimen for the division, which was part of what drew drew us to him. Is just that it's hard to find guys that are legitimate to or legit light heavyweight size and also good athletes. Uh, on that note. That brings us to our main event, Luis Firmino, Carlos Fodor. Vic, take it away. All right, first off, we got two guys that have, I guess we could pretty much consider them. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what, the, what probably would be the correct term. They're both very sturdy veterans. They both fought for multiple major organizations. Now, Fodor has fought for King of the Cage, Strike Force. He even had that one brief stint in the UFC. Um where he lost to uh, Sam Stout by decision and eventually was released. Uh, Firmino fought for M1, Shudo, Pride Bushido, Dream. Um, you know, he's, he's tra- well, let's start with Firmino, who's fought. He's uh, mainly training out of the Black Zillions, and he's 33 years old, despite the mileage that he's very obviously got. I think it's Firmino, right? Unless he switched. I, at last check, he was it? I, unless, I don't know. Because that, that... He, he was on the season of the Ultimate Fighter, was he on? And... I believe he was competing as. Oh, no, maybe you must no, be right. He's Black Zillions because Jurisic was top team 
too. Yeah, and no, I'm pretty sure that I'm pretty sure that he was like zones for yeah. that uh, for that season. I'm pre- I think he started or he was for some time at ATT uh, and then eventually moved to Black Zones. Okay. I'm not yeah, totally sorry. sure, but okay, well. that's fine. Firmino's 18 and six as a professional with seven submissions on his record and one TKO. And the reason for that is he's very much one of those flypaper type grapplers. He will close a distance, he'll grab on you, and then from there it's just a series of chain events. Whether it's taking you down with the body lock, whether it's pulling guard, somehow he's going to have something hanging on to his opponent. He's currently on a five-fight win streak. You know, he's um, although he unfortunately hasn't fought since June of 2014. And he does have a pretty much a who's who on his record of really, really big name guys. But uh, most of the better, the guys that are on the better end, most of them are people that he's lost to. You know, he's got losses to Acevedo, Tetsuya Kawajiri twice, uh, Francisco Trinaldo, and John Alessio. He does have some wins over guys like Imanari, uh, Miyata, Ryan Healy, Toby Amada, and uh, Luis Palomino as well. Now. It's going to be much more of a gritty wrestling type thing because for it's, it's another thing that you see that um, you don't see too many Brazilians that have polished up their wrestling very well. This guy has, and he seems to combine it very much with a lot of chain grappling, a lot of control, a lot of keeping the guy down where he wants the fight to be. I'm going to be taking on a guy like Fodor who's very good at keeping his opponent up against the cage. Again, seems to like to really close a distance, but he's not really afraid to let his hands go. Um, when it comes to his striking, he's certainly a guy who likes to keep it in the phone booth, which makes things a little more disorienting because what we've noticed a lot in MMA is guys seem to sort of like to, when it comes to the feeling out process, keep a bit of distance to see what happens with the feints and the jabs. Not this guy, no. He gets in close, and then he starts working from there for some of his bouts. Uh, Fodor is currently 10-4 and four as a professional, 5-2 and two as an amateur. He's got five submissions on his record. Now, he does have some losses to guys like Pat Healy and uh, Bugisila Colosa up in the Asian scene. And he has been guys like uh, Thomas Diagne, David Douglas, and James Terry, and Justin Wilcox. So he has beaten some more mid-level guys, um, but he's also sort of lost to those guys, too. He's never really fought... Uh, the, the higher level opponent that Firmino has fought and lost to, which is a bit disconcerting as well. Very much high and tight with his uh, striking game, kind of much, kind of like Jorge Masvidal in terms of his stance. Um, likes to keep things nice and tight, and he's always looking to strike. Despite the fact that he's he very much a clinch-heavy guy for a lot of his bouts, he's always looking at ways to not just improve position, but keep striking no matter what. And that also applies to his ground game. That said, I still got to think that Firmino, not only for being the better athlete, but being a better grappler, a very controlling grappler, uh, I really think Firmino's going to take this. And it may not be the most exciting bout, but it's something. <laughs> All right. On that note... I... <laughs> okay, I, know, Eddie. I know. I know. It's some Rain Man shit. I know. I get it. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, you got to pick me up here. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, let's start with this though. Okay. So, uh, you know, Kara's uh, Fodor is the brother of Phoenix Jones, who is <laughs> the superhero from Seattle who beats people up in the streets or something or points them out, whatever he does. He's know. outside of Zane's house right now, keeping him safe, like Ving Rhames in that ADT commercial. <laughs> That's right. That's right. No. Um. I don't know. This has the makings of a stinker, but you know, it might also surprise us in, in a real scrappy kind of just back and forth kind of match. Um, you let are me not start. selling that. You know that, right? What's that? <laughs> you are not selling that possibility. If that was a sales pitch, <laughs> <laughs> I would not be buying the off chance that this is an, a, a fun scrappy fight. I don't know. I think uh, Fodor has a, a good chance of making it an exciting fight. You know, he tries his best to make it exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's important to mention that he was supposed to fight my guy, Mike Ricci, who got injured, unfortunately. Um, you know, he got injured in that tournament we just had, which I picked to win, and he looked like he was on his way to winning the tournament, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And boom, got injured, got taken out, and then scheduled this fight, and then boom, hip injury, so he's out again. So we're going to have to wait to see the uh, the uh, exasperating talents of the Mike Ricci. All right, but uh, so back to this bout. You know, it's real tough how this is going to go down. You got Fodor who 
you know, he's a real fast starter, juggernaut type to come straight forward right at you. Um, he's going to just start throwing punches and combos until he gets in close. He's going to grab you and then just start with the dirty boxing. That's kind of his M.O. Um, on the other side, you got Luis Firmino, who, I mean, the dude is super strong and he has no neck whatsoever. He's like, it's just like shoulders with the head placed in between. Uh, I mean, the dude is freaking, he's a Hulk. And he's a grinder. I mean, he just grabs a hold of you and doesn't let go. Uh, he's got really solid uh, top control. And, you know, he's got the BJJ to keep you on your ass. And it's it's hard to get on your feet when, when that guy's on top of you. And that could be a real problem in this one. As far as uh, Firmino's stand-up goes, you know, he's got really heavy hands. But he's kind of a one-off striker. He's not really out there throwing, you know, high volume, which is a good thing because he, he tends to throw looping punches and he's a little bit exposed while he's throwing these punches, and that makes him a little bit hittable. And we've seen him get tagged a bunch, but fortunately he has a really good chin, and I think that is going to be uh, the determining factor in this fight. I think he's going to be able to eat enough punches to get inside to take the, to get the takedown. I think I think that might be the story of this, and it's just going to be a whole bunch of that, a whole bunch of takedowns, um, coming off the strikes, getting uh, Fodor to overcommit, double leg, and it just might be a lot of Fodor on his back for this fight. So, unfortunately, it has the makings of a boar fest, but I'm hoping Fodor knocks him out on the feet. That's what well, I want to happen. If... Will it happen? Probably not. But I'm going to pick Fodor. I'm just going to pick him just, just because. Just because. Okay, well, if you are into gambling, there may, and I'm not sure. You'll have to check on this because I'm only looking at it through you know, the odds in front of me. But there may be some serious betting opportunity here because it looks like a website has the odds flipped. So, what? Uh, oh, nice. <laughs> Luis Firmino is the favorite across oh. the board. Minus uh, 217 up to minus 240, except on the Greek, where he's plus 170. <laughs> Yikes. Yeah. One second, I'll be right back. Yeah. yeah. Somebody knows something we don't know. <laughs> Either that or somebody getting fired. Carlos Fodor is the underdog, plus 196 down... Oh, no, yeah, plus 196 down to plus 180 except that same website where he's minus 230. So if you can get in on that and bet Carlos Fordor at plus 196 and Luis Firmino at plus 170, then you could get a, li a little something either way. Hmm. Hey. So. <laughs> Eddie's hatching a plot right now. Like, how much do know, I have to put down? It's just, it's great. I don't the know wheels how. are turning. Mm. I don't know if that those odds are still going to be there for people, but that's what I'm seeing right in front of me. That's just a just throwing that out there. If you're a total complete degenerate and you have nothing better to do right now, <laughs> that might be an opportunity made just for you. Uh, you're already watching this card. Why the hell not? I mean, exactly. you're, you're watching us talk about this card. So. You, yeah, yeah. Which, uh, which yeah. is different because we're fine. And I mean, come on, the ladies love Eddie. So I mean, really, let's, you know. All right. Uh, yeah. I do what I can. It's and the hair. It's it, the hat yeah. too. It's it is nice it. hair. I got to yeah. admit, even as somebody who has always been known for having nice hair, you got nice hair. Thank mm. you, Zane. I appreciate that. I try. Um, just uh, one last thing to mention here. Uh, World Series of Fighting's next event is going to be Marlon Moraes versus Joseph Barajas. Um, I'm just as confused as you are <laughs> as to why that's happening, but that is a thing that's happening. And the return of Timur Valiev. So I really, really hope that they fatten that one up and that it doesn't end up looking like this. Otherwise, we got to start questioning the health of the organization as a whole. Yeah, I mean, we already they, they've got a couple of events scheduled out in front of that with uh, Gagey Foster and... Shields Fitch. Shields Fitch, yeah. So, I mean, whatever's going on, it looks like just this month and next Ooh. month are kind of a dark spot on the radar. Yeah, but I'm excited right. for those, the Gaethje and uh, Foster. I think that's going to be fireworks. Yeah, that should be a fun fight. That's going to be fireworks. On that and, note, we've yeah. spent way too much time talking about all this already. 
So it's time to wrap the show. You can find me on Twitter at Zane Simon. You can find Eddie on Twitter at the Eddie Mercado. You can find Vic on Twitter at Vic M. Rodriguez. You can find us all on Bloody Elbow. Give MMA Nation dot com D O T C O M over on YouTube a follow and click the thumbs up like button on this video if you enjoyed it because Lord knows we need it. And uh, on that note, join us all next time. We'll be coming at you with. You know, all, all our normal shows knuckle up, and I believe we've, we've got a UFC event next week, don't we? Yeah, Bader and Johnson, right? Bader Johnson. So we'll have mm-hmm. Care Don't Care, um, Vivisection, There's Six a, Round, If I'm I sorry, Did It. There's Bellator the as well. Hmm? There's Bellator as well coming up next and, week. And the Bellator show. I've been doing a bunch of interviews for that, so we'll have those coming out. All sorts of shit coming at you if you stay tuned. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and see you all next week.